Welcome to Amusement Sparks, the unofficial theme park design show. These are completely hypothetical, just fan-made creations, and uh, anyone can do this. My guests are from all walks of life, so I definitely encourage all listeners to join the community on Reddit or Facebook and make your ideas heard, and who knows, maybe you'll be a guest on this very podcast. Um, today we're going to be talking about Dungeons and Dragons. My guest on this episode is... Hey, uh, my name's Peter. And Peter, what do you do for a living? Like, I freelance graphic design, but, like, right now I'm working at Geek Squad in Best Buy. I'm the head I'm the head repair agent there. Oh, that's awesome. Um, could you tell us about your podcast, too? So, like, I do a tabletop gaming podcast uh, and video game podcast called Peter vs. Peter, where we just we talk about anything from board games, video games, uh, role-playing games, just anything, like, nerdy that you could play, pretty much. Okay, so let's talk about the basics of D&D. So this is a game from the late 70s that's basically evolved from, like, strategy board games, like, war gaming, kind of, in a you know like adapted it to include more story and more interactivity and um kind of like a fantasy type setting um but for D D to function you have someone who's the dungeon master or the game master or the dm um and this person comes up with basically the story i mean they can get the story from from books or from resources online but they're in charge of the narration and the setting and that kind of thing and setting up the story and then they give the players options to uh, decide how they want to begin their their adventure. What do they want to do? So the people who are playing inhabit the role of a character, and they have certain items and skills and equipment and certain you know values and uh, objectives. And then the DM tells them the story, like here's your your character is in this posi- position, this place. What are they going to do? And then you kind of inhabit that role of your character. You're like, what would the character do in this position? So it's kind of like improv in a way. But you need to try to develop your character and make your character stronger, you know, get better items, um, and just further your character along in this plot that's created by someone else. So it's a really interesting uh, interactive story that's been around for, you know, years and years now. It's a really cool system. Yeah, I, I like the, because because I do, I am artist, I like the creative aspect to it. So it's just like making these worlds and, and writing these campaign settings for people to live in. Um of course, there's the the, the traditional D and D campaigns um, that that already exist. You could go uh, Eberron or Greyhawk or um, <clears throat> or like Dark Sun, and those are fully fleshed out worlds that Wizards of Coast gives out to people. Mm-hmm. But I I like making my own world. Like, yeah, I like me too. It, like uh, the way, when I was first exposed, this is kind of an embarrassing story, but I was in I think fourth grade and. Um, one of my friend's older brothers was like going to have a D and D birthday party. And so I got invited and I was like, Oh, this is awesome. And I never heard of it before. I, I knew about like role-playing games, like role-playing video games. And so my friend described this to me, like on the bus ride from school or whatever, like this party is going to have, these people are going to come and it's going to be like, we're in this world and we, you know, we make a character and then we have to fight things and like build up our stats and all this stuff. And so in my imagination, there's going to be, like, a treadmill. Like, I thought it was going to be, like, physical things that we were going to be doing, like, physically trying to represent this character in actual combat. Like, I, I was picturing something like LARPing, even though I never heard of that before, which is live-action role-playing. So yeah. I thought it was going to be all, like, hands-on and, like, uh, Legends of the Hidden Temple kind of thing. Like, I was so confused. <laughs> and then, you know, the guy comes over, and, like, we go to the party, and it's, like, everyone's sitting around the dining table, and I'm like, wait a minute. What is, what is who's this? this? Who's this, like middle-aged man who just has a bunch of books and paper and pencils and i was like this is going to be terrible like i feel like i'm going to school or something and then it was actually amazing you know you get to make your own character you have a character sheet so you come up with what character your uh, character's race is going to be like details about what they look like and where they're from and you get to be a really creative and it really encourages that creativity because everyone else who's playing is doing it too so i think when you're creative by yourself sometimes it can be hard to get started because you're like you know, I could just sit here and watch TV, but if everyone else 
in your vicinity is also being creative in the same way, it really gets you going. It's like, okay, I got to keep up. You know, my character's got to be, uh, I've got to develop this character. I got to get cracking on this. It, it was a really fun experience for me when I was in fourth grade or whatever. It wasn't at all what I was expecting. Like, I think I wore like, you know, tennis shoes and like, I was like ready to like work out. And then, you know, we were just going to be eating Cheetos and sitting around this dinner table, like for hours on end. <laughs> it was great. I, I actually started uh, LARPing before D&D, oh, cool. but, the, but the LARP I was in was all combat oriented. So it was, it was, it was more of like a full contact sport. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was all like foam swords and stuff. And we always said, we'll never play D&D. We'll never play D&D. Yeah. One day we all <laughs> broke down and we started playing. It was like raining outside and you're like, oh, dang it. We can't LARP today. We got to stay inside. Oh, no, we would. No, we would. The rain Doing is the, the best rain. time to play. Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. at the park we played that had a creek and we just dive in the water. Oh, anyway, wow, Lord that's awesome. <laughs> that sounds super fun. That's cool. Um, and then it, when I was in like sixth grade, um, a couple of my friends and I were in the percussion section in band, and like our band director didn't care at all about us, so we we just like kind of sat back there while everyone else was practicing, and we just made up our own role playing game stories, and like it'd be based on. Uh, you know, whatever video game was on the cover of Nintendo Power or whatever. Like, none of us had played the game, but we're like, this looks so cool. Let's make up a story about it. And uh, there was there was no like combat or stats or numbers or anything. It was just kind of interactive storytelling, and it was so much fun to make those up every week. And we'd do it like literally every single day at school. So we got pretty creative and pretty wild with our stories, and uh, we learned you know what each other liked in in those role playing games so we would yeah. be able to kind of customize them a little bit more for who we were playing with and it was a very like formative uh experience for me D&D is such like a it's not really a lifestyle but it's like a secret thing like you kind of have to know somebody to like get into the circle a little bit cuz you can't really do it by yourself unless you're playing one of the video games based on D&D yeah. but it's such a cool social activity to do like any kind of you know pen and paper role playing game cuz it's it takes so much more imagination and so much more uh work like it's it's a bit like acting and a bit like you know screenwriting and you have to kind of design levels and there's a lot that goes into it and it's very flexible of a system no there's there's definitely a lot i have like notebooks just full of just stuff and then like hundreds of documents of like settings locations shops characters and like the people who play don't really know how much i put into it Mm -hmm. which is fine because they're just playing (laughs) right Uh, but it's just it uh, to me i like the outcome like seeing having seeing them have fun is what i really like about it This game came out originally in 77, and it's now 2017, you know, almost. So we're going to say this is the 40th anniversary of this tabletop role-playing game. So what kind of amusement park can we make on this? We know that there's a fan base for Dungeons & Dragons. I feel like each person going to the the park would have to inhabit the role of one of the characters. Like, I don't don't think there'd be a way to make someone be the, the dungeon master. You know what I mean? I feel like the park has to be the experience like the world that you're going into and when you go to this park you're an adventurer within this world is that right is that what you would expect yeah no no i agree like the park itself is the dm and yeah. you're going on adventures throughout the park like so i go to universal a lot okay like, every week living in florida so, right yeah yeah well, yeah like an hour away from the park oh, it's, it's nice that's so nice that's awesome for like a dungeon dragon themed park it would have to be as immersive as like the Harry Potter lands. Yes. Like Wizarding World of Harry Potter is the reason why it's so amazing is because it's completely immersive. Mm-hmm. Um, especially on the Diagon Alley side, you like walk through a building and you're in, it doesn't even seem like you're in the same theme park because it's so it's closed off and it's its own world. Yeah. So like to translate that, I feel like the D and D park would have to, the entire park would have to be like that. Just mm-hmm. fully immersive environments. I mean, you could probably even steal like the whole magic wand thing. But like, yeah, yeah, the, <laughs> the magic wand feature is is that Wizarding World of Harry Potter, right? And there's certain things you can interact with with your wand, and it makes stuff like light up and move around, right? Yeah, yeah. There's there's a water fountain that you can only use by waving a wand at it. That's so <laughs> cool. And I think I've, I mean, I haven't been to Wizarding World of Harry Potter, but from what I've heard, a lot of the parts that 
kind of make it feel immersive is that it doesn't feel like a theme park, meaning that there's not big open spaces and like queue lines everywhere. It's like you kind of have to cram into some like tight spaces and like things you're not used to doing at theme parks where it's it's all about staying far away from other people and like having big open spaces um, to accommodate big crowds. It's like we're going to build this the way it would be in real life and then people can just squeeze into it if they want to get in here. Yeah, a lot of the queue lines are hidden, so mm-hmm. you can't even see them. When the Diagon Alley opened up, the they had queue lines for each of the shops, Yeah, but they're like behind fake building facades, so it's oh, actually wow. like behind a store. Um, mm-hmm. Eventually, now that it's been open for so long, they transformed some of those areas that were queue lines mm-hmm. into shops themselves. So oh, like cool. one of them, they turned into like a, a photo place, um, and then they turned the old photo place into a candy shop recently. So, That's awesome. It's, they they obviously had a plan to mm-hmm. go with, and then it worked out. So. Yeah, so it can be done. We can hide the queue lines. It doesn't have to feel like a theme park. It can feel like you're just going into some like creepy old woods or like an an old, you know, town with a tavern and cobblestone streets and everything like that. Yeah, or like a dungeon and you're underground. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Cool. Um, so I think. Another thing that would be really interesting about not having a, a dungeon master in your group, you know, normally when you go to play D&D with a group of people, one of them, you know, is going to be pulling the strings. Whereas if you go to this place, everyone in your whole party is on the same page. Like, none of them know what's about to come up. Whereas if you're in D&D and, uh, you know, someone's, someone's going to know what's going to happen that day. They know what the big surprise is already. But your whole party will have no clue about what's about to happen, which I think would be really thrilling. And all the surprises would kind of catch you off guard. And if there is a little bit of an interactive element, you know, if you get to choose to go left or right at one point, then the next time you come back, it's going to be a different experience. Like that interactivity makes it a more flexible environment and makes it a little bit more exciting to return. It's not like, oh, yeah, I've been on all these roller coasters. I'm going to go here and do it again. It's like, well, maybe you didn't. You don't actually know. Like maybe there's no map of the whole park. So you don't actually know if there's a a fourth roller coaster coming up or if you're at the (laughs) end of the park. You don't know. Like That could be fun. Yeah, there there would have to be, a, like, a theme of, like, you deciding what to do, mm-hmm. because, like, the whole point of, like, not the whole point, but, like, playing as a, a player character in a, in a campaign, you're making all the decisions, and the dungeon master is, a good dungeon master is, ro- like, helping you through your decisions, mm-hmm. and, like, guiding you, but not forcing you to events in two places. So, like, if there's that, like, hidden, like, oh, you could go left or right, that would make the park so much better and it will fit more with the theme. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And it would be really cool if um, the park employees just kind of stay hidden. Like, you know, maybe there's a tree at the fork in the road and there's like someone inside of that tree and you you can't see like there's mesh or something where they can see out and see what you're about to do. And so then yeah. they can pull a lever and, you know, make the... And they can like manually trigger different events to happen, whether, you know, the lights go out or like you hear a scary sound or there's some thunder that strikes or a tree like comes out and tries to grab you or whatever. It'd be really cool. It's, it's almost like a haunted house kind of element. Yeah. You could definitely have those in like a dark forest type of situation. You could have people in there just waiting to like come after you. Like, I don't think they want to actually like touch you like at one of those really hardcore haunted houses, but having (laughs) animatronics that move around and, you know, startle you and uh, maybe try to misdirect you or split your group up would be really a pretty like thrilling thing to have. (laughs) 